Hello, it's Scott Manley here. In the last week, we have found out that NASA are going back to Venus with not one, but two missions. So these are two missions that are selected from the latest batch of Discovery Program candidates. They had four, and uh, the two that were going to Venus were the ones that were picked. And unfortunately, this does mean that we are not going to be flying by Triton anytime soon, and we're not going to be sending an explorer to look at the volcanoes of Io. But we are going to be sending an atmosphere probe and lander in the form of Da Vinci Plus and an orbiter which will map the planet in the form of Veritas. Now, I have talked in the past about various ways of exploring the surface of Venus long term. Things like clockwork rovers or high temperature semiconductors, but neither of these things are on display here. This is uh, two missions which are very uh, much similar to older missions, albeit with 30 plus years of technological advancement. The last time NASA sent a spacecraft to Venus was Magellan in 1989, and that spacecraft was actually mostly built from spare parts. The Da Vinci lander is going to be the first lander to go to Venus since Vega in the mid-1980s. The Da Vinci Plus descent probe will only return data for a couple of hours, but the technology will have moved on a whole lot, and there's a lot of questions that this can answer in that very limited time span. I often like to talk about how the surface of Venus is one of the most inhospitable locations in the solar system. The surface pressure is about 93 atmospheres. The temperature is hot enough to melt lead. It is acidic. It is choking. It will asphyxiate you. You do not want to go there. And yet many people didn't realize how, what kind of hellhole Venus was until like the start of the space age. My dad had a bunch of books I remember him showing me, things that he had when he was a child. And it talked about what could be under the clouds of Venus. Telescopes couldn't see under it. And with nothing to see there, people's imaginations ran wild and they imagined crazy things like jungles with dinosaurs that we could go and hunt. Unfortunately, those clouds on Venus are sulfuric acid, and yet they contain the majority of the water that is left on Venus. We, it's now known that Venus was very much wet in its distant history. And you might wonder, how can we know what Venus was like in the past? And of course, the answer is science. Uh, in 1978, a spacecraft was launched called the Pioneer Multiprobe. It flew past Venus and it dropped a number of probes in. And one large probe contained a mass spectrometer. As it descended through the atmosphere, it was sampling the atmosphere and basically measuring the atomic mass of the molecules and atoms that it was finding there. And the analysis of this showed that there was an excessive amount of deuterium compared to hydrogen. So hydrogen has an isotope called deuterium that has an extra neutron and it's twice as heavy. Now on Earth, one in every 7,000 hydrogen atoms is actually a heavier deuterium atom, but on Venus it's one in 70. And that is about a hundred times greater. And the reason for this is that over time uh, water evaporated from Venus and the lighter hydrogen atoms escaped more easily, leaving behind the heavier deuterium atoms. So if we assume that Venus formed from roughly the same material as Earth, then you would expect the ratios of hydrogen and deuterium to be the same. But since Venus has 100 times more uh, deuterium, you have to imagine at some point it had 100 times more regular hydrogen and therefore at least 100 times more water in the past. And that is, of course, a lower estimate, assuming that no deuterium at all escapes. And the lack of water on Venus can also be responsible for its really thick atmosphere. On Earth, carbon dioxide and other gases that come up from volcanoes, they go through various processes and end up getting incorporated into rocks. And a lot of these processes involve water. But if you take the water out of the system, these gases get stuck in the atmosphere, they don't get deposited into rocks, and so you end up with an atmosphere that gets thicker and thicker and thicker until you get the modern-day hellhole that is Venus.
So we can imagine that DaVinci Plus will do this a whole lot better than the Pioneer probes. I mean, the Pioneer probes were obviously great, but the uh, data bandwidth they used for mass spectrometer was 40 bits per second. Nowadays, we'll do a lot better. The other thing it's going to do is take pictures, a lot of pictures. You know that there's less than 10 pictures of the surface of Venus? All taken by the Venera landers, and they were all very similar in design. They had a spherical pressure vessel, they have this landing ring with the shock absorbers. Above that, there's this disc, and that is the parachute. It, they just they didn't have a regular parachute. They just needed this disc to decelerate them because the atmosphere is so thick. And then above that is this sort of circular spiral antenna. Venera 11 and 12 both carry colored cameras, but the lens caps failed to separate. So these images are from Venera 13 and 14. So DaVinci Plus on its way down will be capturing imagery, giving us good resolutions all the way down to impact. But obviously this is only off a very small section of the surface. If you want to look at a global thing, you need an orbiter. And we've been mapping Venus with orbiters for a very long time. Again, this is from Pioneer. It used synthetic aperture radar to give us a topographical map in the late 1970s. Uh, several of the v uh, Venera probes followed up and did their own version, but the sort of definitive map that is used for everything, including those visualizations I used earlier for Space Engine, was Magellan. And this was the last mission that NASA sent to Venus. Actually, that's not true because several NASA missions have flown past Venus because it's a great place to get a gravity assist from. Galileo went there, Cassini went there, but Magellan, that launch from the space shuttle, it was the first interplanetary spacecraft to launch from the space shuttle, and it spent several years mapping the surface using SAR. Now, I find this to be a fascinating mission because, well, in part, because it's built from a bunch of pieces that were designed for other spacecraft. The main bus is from a Voyager. That antenna is designed for Voyager. The thrusters are Voyager. Then there's a lot of electronics, avionics, attitude control systems that were for the Galileo spacecraft. So thanks to the work of Magellan, we have maps of Venus that are good to about 100 meter resolution. That means you can go to Google Maps and look at a map of Venus with a bunch of the terrain already laid out for you. It's great, although it looks decidedly 2D. If you really want to fly over Venus, I highly recommend you get Space Engine and you can turn off the clouds if you like or not, or you can just fly anywhere in the solar system or the entire universe because Space Engine is pretty amazing. So how is Veritas going to improve on this? Well, its main instrument is VISAR, the Venus Interferometric Synthetic Aperture Radar. It's basically a new, better synthetic aperture radar. It is going to perform surface scans off the whole globe over its mission. It's going to measure uh, pixel accuracy to about 15 meters with five meter vertical resolution. And because it's going to visit some areas multiple times, they'll be able to do uh, compare each area via interferometry. That's where they can actually see how things have changed within a region. And that is going to be accurate to about 0.2 centimeters, two millimeters. And the reason they want this stunning accuracy is because they want to see if Venus is still geologically active. They want to see if there are active deformation zones because we don't know whether, uh, you know, whether the surface of Venus was formed a long time ago and is pretty much dead or whether there is active tectonics going on. One of the interesting things about Venus is there are these areas called tesserae, which we think may actually be the Venusian equivalent of continents, like were formed on Earth. But in the absence of water, is there are these being formed by the same mechanic or is there something else going on? A second instrument carried is the Venus Emissivity Mapper, and this is a basically a thermal imaging spectrometer. It's going to look through the clouds. They've carefully chosen specific band passes where the infrared light passes through the clouds with uh, less uh, interference. And basically, they'll be able to sample areas of the surface and view them in multiple infrared wave bands. And what they're looking for is the light being emitted by the surface because it's hot. And 
While you might imagine the surface of Venus is being kept at a pretty constant temperature, due to like the temperature of Venus being very heavily controlled by that thick atmosphere, there will be differences in how the surface emits, and that will tell you the materials it's made of, it'll give you clues to the ground structure, and so it may actually be possible to see differences between relatively recent lava flows and weathered lava flows that have been exposed to the atmosphere over time. It's a multiband instrument operating at about one micrometer. From the six bands that they're going to use, it will allow them to distinguish certain mineralogy differences. And it, obviously the whole thing is going to be operating primarily on the night side of Venus because you don't want to contaminate your light with, well, n light from the sun. And finally, a lot of consideration is being given to how it communicates with the deep space network because not only will it be sending data, but they will be very carefully measuring the Doppler shifts when they are doing these communication sessions because they're going to use that as a reference point for measuring changes in the spacecraft's velocity and therefore try to find ge you know, gravitational features, perhaps subsurface structure which hasn't been visible via other methods. So Veritas will fly at about the end of the decade, uh, and that will be 70 years since the first mission to successfully fly by Venus, Mariner 2, also built by the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Humanity has sent dozens of missions to Venus over the decades, uh, and yet we still don't have a good answer for whether Venus is a geologically active world or whether its interior is as quiet as its surface is lifeless. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.